I have, uh, have not been asked to do this, but I'm going to do it before I start today. Um, all of you are aware of what's going on in Virginia and New York, I think, where the abortion issue is concerned. Are you not? Is everybody aware of the decisions made in New York and Virginia? So if you don't know about those, you need to be an educated, informed about them. I will say that that does not change where we stand here as a church. We are against abortion at any level. Can I get a witness? Amen. We will remain against abortion. We will love those who have had abortions, and we will help them uh, find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are opposed to it. And someone asked, well, what can we do? Well, one thing you can do is you can go on social media and you can use the power of positive words. Um, you can say, uh, I'm opposed to what's going on in Virginia and New York. And the power of positive words is that we, we say that children have rights and the unborn has a right to life. Can I get a witness? Amen. 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 Social media is where you go first. Then you can write a letter to your congressman and your senators here in New York, uh, North Carolina. God help us if we were in New York. And you can, say, you can say, do not bring that garbage up here. We've got enough garbage to deal with in North Carolina, and we do not need that on our conscience. And then if it comes to a vote, uh, you can do like my grandkids do when they don't get their way. They pitch a holy fit. So good to see all of you here today. How many of you have older siblings? Would you raise your hand? You know, uh, God bless you. I, all my siblings are still alive, and, and I'm thankful for that. And, and, um, but when I was a kid, I was the runt of the family. And as the runt of the family, my older brothers, I had, uh, I, there's five of us boys, and three of them were older than me. And man, they would hold me down, and they would put their, they would twist my arm behind my back, and they would say, Say, Uncle! And I'd go, there ain't no uncle around here. And they'd go, we, we're not letting you up until you yell for mercy. So I learned how to say uncle and mercy all at the same time. And I yelled a lot back in those days. Now, my brothers were punishers, and I was indeed in need of mercy. I've come to love mercy. But one of my favorite mercy stories is, and I've told it here so many times that I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to use it again, but it's so funny and so important, and I'm going to tell it again. And if, you don't, if you've heard it about 16 times, just go like this while I'm speaking. Like, I've heard that 20 times. And when I was in my 20s, Mary Jane and I hadn't been married long. My daddy had this old uh, gremlin that I drove, and, and uh, I had to take some kids home after school one day. And I was, I was running down one of the side streets then, South Carolina. And um, I don't think there are any major streets in South Carolina, all side streets. But I was running down one of the side streets, and uh, I, I, I wanted to show off for these kids that were in the car with me, and so I tried to jump a bridge and um, in that gremlin. Well, the gremlin wasn't going to go very fast. I didn't jump the bridge, but on the other side was a patrolman with a radar gun. And as soon as I I went, oh, no. So anyway, long story made short, he wrote me a ticket, and he gave me a court date. And so I, I showed up at court, and I was mad that I'd gotten that ticket. I was more embarrassed that, uh, because of the boys that were in the car with me, and they were all laughing at me. And the court date was on a Saturday. Uh, evidently, on Saturday is the only time court meets in South Carolina, at least where I grew up. And so I went in for my court date, and, and I walked in, you know, with my chip on my shoulder and my attitude. And so they brought me into the, the magistrate's office there. And here is the judge sitting at the end of the table. And uh, he had his clerk there and he had the officers there and so forth. And right before I was to, my case was to be heard and my case was on the docket, uh, there was a, a, a poor fellow who had been drinking for a long, long time. And I say so because he had been arrested the day before. He was still so drunk he couldn't stand up. The chief of police actually was holding him up so that he wouldn't fall. And, and, and the, the judge went through his formalities and he said to this poor drunken fellow, he said, Sir, I have to ask you if you'd like to have a trial by jury or a trial by the judge. And the, the drunk guy went, I, I want to try the jury, Your Honor. And uh, that's exactly the way it went. And I lie not. He was so drunk. And uh, the judge said, excuse me? And the chief of police said, he said he'd talk to you, Your Honor. <laughs> and then the judge proceeded 
to hear the case, which lasted about 30 seconds, and then he sentenced him to 90 days in jail. Well, now I'm watching all of this. My case is next. And I'm thinking, Chip, get off my shoulder. And I, my, my knees were wobbly. And so when it came time, the judge says, okay, we have this charge against Mr. Waters here. You got a ticket here, and he's, he's decided to show up in court today. Uh, Mr. Waters, would you like to uh, question the officer? They read the charges against me and so forth. And, and I went, uh, 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 no, Your Honor, uh, I'm only here to plead for mercy. <laughs> and he was so taken back, he went, you're here to what? what? And I said, I'm, ple- I'm here to plead for mercy, Your Honor. Mercy, I'm guilty. I'm just guilty. And so he said, well, you know, it's in my power to give you mercy. And I said, uh, I was hoping that was the case. You know, because I, th- I thought, I'm going to be in the tank with that, that drunk guy. And he's going to be throwing uh, yeah. He gave me a little bit of mercy. I still had to pay for the ticket, but it didn't go on my insurance, so I didn't get any points. So I got mercy that day. And I was very appreciative of it. Can I get a witness? Are you, have, you ever, have any of you ever gotten mercy? Can I just see the hands of those who have received mercy in some situation? The judge had power over me. He had the right to punish me. Now, fast forward a few years. A few years, I had a good buddy, and he got caught doing something he shouldn't have done. It was bad. He was in ministry like I was. And uh, when I heard about it, I had absolutely no compassion for him. I had no mercy for him in my heart. And even though he was repentant, I thought, well, you deserve what you got. You shouldn't have done that. His offense wasn't even toward me, but I punished him. And you know how I punished him? By excluding him from my circle of friends. I'm going to tell you something. To this day, I am haunted by my lack of mercy for him, my decision not to extend mercy to him. A few years later, fast forward again, 10 or 15 years later, I was in a situation where I really needed mercy again. And so I asked the Lord, and he granted me mercy. I asked the people that I'd offended. They granted me mercy and you know what I learned? I learned real quickly that I learned that I was not so quick to give mercy if I didn't think I needed it. In other words, if I hadn't done a, a specific offense. But I also learned that when I received mercy, it made me want to be more merciful. Now, I'm going to say something today. Today, I'm going to use my experiences and the truth from God's Word to, to attempt to give you a case for mercy. During the 2019 year, we're talking about the Pallet Initiative, and, and I'm going to tell you something that God has done in my heart. I was telling my wife this last night. God has taken me back to some events and some people and things in my life where I needed to go back and say, God, I really messed that up. I really messed that up, and I, you know, I, I need to deal with this. And so when God takes you back, he's going to take his truth. He's going to soften your heart. Now, let me just say this. Uh, I was in the doctor's office this week, um, my uh, pulmonologist, and I always talk to her about the Lord uh, because she's a Christian. And and since I'd seen her last, she said to me, she said, you know, um, I uh, I grew up in a particular church, and I always worried about God coming down just bashing me over the head. And I walked out of church every Sunday feeling like I'm such a sinner, and I'm just going to get beat up. When, as soon as I get out this door, and I felt beat up in church and so forth. And she said, and then a year or so ago, she said, I found out that God wants me in a relationship with him. And she said, it's so freeing. I feel so loved, and I, I feel so forgiven, and so forth and so on. And I want to tell you something. God wants that relationship with you. He's going to use his truth. He's going to soften your heart like he did mine. And he's going to make you more like Jesus so you can deal with All sorts of issues in your life, whether it's mercy, love, humility, cooperation, any of the things that we have on our pallet initiative this year. And he's going to help you use that in your life. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about this issue of mercy or lack thereof in your life. And I hope that when God takes you back to that, maybe in your minds today, I hope that this message that I'm going to share with you today will help you prepare for that time. Now, here's the gospel truth, because we, you know, the Bible holds all things for us that we need to do. Can I get a witness? Okay. Not the Reader's Digest. Of course, y'all don't even know what that is anymore, do you? Yeah, I'm so out of touch with, uh, does Reader's Digest still exist? I'm sorry about that. Somebody named something online that I can relate people to. Nobody in here wants to say or do what you watch. The issue is you're not going to find any truth except in God's Word that's going to actually help you. Can I get a witness? And here's what Jesus said. Therefore be what? What's that word? Merciful, just as your Father also is. 
merciful. So he's telling us we're to be full of mercy. And our 2019 pallet theme is designed us to help others, to give a, a sense of serving others, and to remind us of our own needs while we accomplish the goal of carrying the goodness of Jesus to our world. And on that pallet, there must be plenty of mercy. Plenty of containers with mercy stamped on them. So this morning, I'm going to try to develop this case for mercy for you by giving you three evidences, three events in Bible events that tell us about mercy. And before we start that journey into mercy, however, we need to nail down a definition. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I used the words quantify and qualify. And, and I want to tell you something in, a, in the if When you talk to people and you speak in general terms and they get it wrong, sometimes it's because you don't qualify things. You say, this is what I mean. Let me qualify it for you. Okay? So everybody, in other words, I need to be specific. Otherwise, they won't understand. And so let's qualify mercy. Mercy is simply having compassion or forgiveness towards someone. And that someone is an offender who broke either God's law or your rules. And then here's the second part of it. You have the power, or someone has the power and ability to punish and do them harm because they offended. All right, so this is different from just having compassion or just having forgiveness. It's the idea that you have the power to punish them. Now, let's take that definition into our Christianity. Would you agree that God has the power to punish us if He so chooses because we have transgressed His law? Would you agree? Yes, of course He does. But is he merciful? The idea is, yes, he is merciful. Here's what his word says, Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in... Stay with me on this. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Can you see that begin to play out? He has compassion and pity on us because we broke his law. The writer of Lamentations, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed... Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, dear God, the writer said. God is merciful, yes? Let's make sure we're on the same page. God is merciful, yes? Yes. Now, Jesus said this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, let me just say something about Jesus' day. It's very similar to our day. The Romans were in charge of the government. They were in charge of the culture. So even though you had Jews who said they believed in God and the one true God, they were still affected by the culture they lived in. And the Romans did not like mercy. In fact, it didn't top the top 100 things that they, was important to them. In fact, one of the Roman philosophers says mercy is a disease of the soul. Can you imagine that? A disease of the soul. They glorified justice and courage and discipline and power, but they didn't value uh, mercy in their culture at all. And you know, the sad fact is we don't value mercy either. We don't value mercy. How many times have I wanted to tell people who came in because of a, a situation in their home or a domestic situation or a place at, uh, at work or even in the church, I, I wanted to say to them, can you just have a little mercy, just a little bit of mercy? See, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Uh, one, of my, one of the writers that I like said, mercy is something we do. In other words, it's action, not just something we feel. It means to help a person in need, to rescue the miserable. Mercy means a sense of pity, plus a desire to help the suffering. Simply saying, I feel your pain is not mercy. Mercy is meeting the need, not just feeling it. Real mercy is pity plus action. See, one of the things that we understand when, when we're merciful, we understand that it doesn't matter if somebody's offended God or us, but mercy is them not getting what the person who offended deserves. Not getting. In other words, what you thought they ought to get, they're not getting that. And the merciful understands that, hey, I, I got a power over this person, and I can punish them in some ways. Now, let's talk about different ways you can punish people, okay? Okay. Some of you, uh, have you ever had that? When I have a conflict with somebody, even if in, in my home, if I have a conflict with Mary Jane, one of the first things, because I'm a southern redneck by birth, all right, one of the first things that comes to my mind, and by the way, northern people are no different either, so, but one of the first things that comes to my mind is, how can I get even? How can I make her pay? One of the first things you say, really? Yeah, now I get over it real, real quick. It only lasts about five seconds. I've been married 42 years. There's a reason I get over it quick. 
but it's the first thought that comes into my mind. If somebody cuts me off on Oleander or college, God forbid, in my neighborhood, I'm immediately going, where's my, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a way I can punish them. Now, let me just say something. How many ways can you punish somebody who's offended you? Well, you, if they broke a law that's a civil law, you can take them to court. You can sue them. We're a sue-happy society, aren't we? Yeah. Um, you can use, uh, you can attempt some act of vengeance, but there are other ways you can punish an offender. How many of you do social media? Facebook, Instagram, Postgram, Flygram, Three Grams, <laughs> No Fat. Uh, I, we all do social media, right? Everybody does social media. So you can go on social media and you can lock and load and you can call them out and you can blast them. Some of y'all are laughing. Uh, Lord, I, the altars are open for those of you. <laughs> the other thing you can do on social media is you can speculate openly about something they probably did. Now, by the way, if you don't have any proof, it's called fake news. <laughs> but everybody reading them is going to go, whoa, did they do that? Now, here's something that I did, what I did to that guy earlier on. You can break relations with somebody and punish them. If you don't have mercy, um, you can say, I'm going to break. So, Brad and I are, are buddies, and Brad is friends with Huck. Huck offends me. I go to Brad and say, It's me or him. If you're going to be my friend, Brad, you got to exclude him. In other words, I'm going to punish him by taking away one of his relationships. Have you ever seen that happen? Is it, I mean, that's like eighth grade, right? We didn't graduate too far from eighth grade, did we? Now, here's the point. You're in the driver's seat when it comes to the ability to punish or damage or harm the offender. But what if, what if you choose to be like God? You choose to be like God, and you say, well, let me just read it. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now, let's get to those Bible events I was telling you about. Let's make the case for mercy. And the first evidence is found in Matthew chapter 18. This is a story of a failure to understand the how much of mercy. That's quantitative. The how much of mercy. Matthew 18, here's the story. A guy owes a political leader, he's called a king, a hefty sum of money. I mean, we're talking a lot of money. We're going to read the scripture in a minute. But the loan is called in. He gets called in, and he's broke. He can't pay his debt. And so the issue is, he, he's looking at this guy saying, man, I can't. And, and I'm sure he gave the reasons why he couldn't. The stock market, I bought it when it was high. It went bust, and I lost everything. Or my house down on Carolina Beach, I built it. I just built it. I didn't have time to get flood insurance, and Florence hit me. And I'm done. I have no money left. My Mercedes is in the shop. My wife is suing me. I don't know what he did, but he didn't have any money left. That's the thing he's saying. But what he did was beg for mercy. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18, can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. So there were others who were called in as well. But in the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars in today's money. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered him that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. Uh, remember what we said, when it comes to mercy, the king had the power to punish. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Now, in this part of the scripture, what happens next is just truly astounding. And before you get all high and mighty about what this guy did, just think, have I ever done anything even remotely close to that? Here's the debtor who had millions of dollars. He was shown mercy, but he went out and found a guy who owed him a few thousand bucks in comparison, and he refused to extend mercy. Verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. Does it sound familiar? And I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king, told him everything that had happened. Verse 32, the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. 
Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus adds this. Now remember, remember, Jesus is talking into a culture where mercy doesn't even top, doesn't even reach the top 100 things that are important. And here's what Jesus said. That's what my heavenly father, remember he's talking to Jews here, and Jews believed in that one God, that, that uh, Jehovah God. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive. And I've added, be merciful to your brothers and sisters from your heart. One of the pastors I love to listen to is Greg Laurie, and Greg Laurie says this of mercy. When we as believers see ourselves as we really are, when we have mourned over our condition, when we have walked in meekness before God and have hungered and thirsted for righteousness, then it will produce mercy in us. We will be more merciful because we recognize how much mercy has been extended to us. You know, the truth is, until we have received a boatload of mercy ourselves and we realize that, we're not going to necessarily want to give anything to anybody else, right? Until we realize it. Now, here's a question. Are you considering exercising your power to punish somebody? Because even, even if he or she is truly repentant, are you going to exercise your power to say, No, I know you say you're sorry, but I am not going to show you any mercy. Evidence event number two, the story of a failure to keep God's priorities first. Now, for this, I want to take you back to a minor prophet, a guy named Jonah. You can keep your hand over there, or you can just watch the screen. Jonah was a, a minor prophet. Let me just summarize his situation for you. He's called of God, and he's called of God to go on a mission. So evidently, this guy was a pretty sharp guy. He's a good preacher, and he said, I want you to go over to Nineveh. I know it's your enemies, but I want you to go over there because they're so evil that, I mean, the, the stench has come up in me. And I, he said, it's reached all the way to heaven. Go over there and tell them they better repent, or I'm going to light them up. Light them up. And so Jonah said, I don't think so. And so he bugged out. He just bugged out. And he took off on a ship. And, of course, you remember the story. He got in there, and the, and the Lord sent a great storm. And they tossed him overboard. He was swallowed by a big fish. And because he was a Baptist and had had Baptist meals before he left, it made the, sick, made the, the big fish real sick. Can I get a witness? <laughs> anyway, he's down in there, and the fish has got a stomach ache. And he's down there for three days. And what is he praying for? Mercy. Mercy, God have mercy on me. And so God does. God has mercy on him. And the big fish said, okay, it's time. I don't have any kale pectic. I don't have any, uh, any, any, anything to sell my stomach. So I'm throwing him up. I throw him up right in Nineveh. He throws him right up in Nineveh. And Jonah goes and he starts preaching. And boy, he unloads every barrel he's got. And guess what? It went good. It went Billy Graham good. All those Ninevites were on their knees. They were coming from the balcony. And they were coming from this side. And they were co coming to the altar. And they came came down to the altar, and you know what? And Jonah, while he should have been rejoicing in their repentance, you know what he did? He wasn't sure that he wanted God to let him off the hook. And so he went out, and he decided, hey, I'm going to wait and watch God burn them up because this is going to be fun. I'm just going to smell them being lit up. And so what God did with Jonah is he removed a few conveniences from him. One was this thing called a, a trailing vine. And this vine, when you study it, it was huge. It, it, it was a great canopy of shade. And if you've ever been to the Mideast in any kind of hot weather, you know that you don't want to be in the sunshine there. And so he's under this shade, and boy, he's, he's just waiting on him to get burned up. And you know what God did? God struck that vine, and it, it wilted. And then Jonah says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing to me? What, what are you doing? And he starts whining, and he adds this to his list of whining complaints. And, and God literally said to him, hey, man, you've really screwed up. Your priorities are in the wrong place. That vine was a here today, gone tomorrow thing. It's temporary. But guess what, Jonah? You made it more important and more valuable than 120,000 people and their souls. The Scripture. But the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you neither tended nor made grow. It sprang up in a night and perished in a night. So should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the left, and many cattle as well? See, here's the deal. If you're going to be like Jonah and, not, and choose not to have mercy, then you have lost the idea of the value of a soul. And remember, 
when somebody is going to, just like forgiveness, if somebody truly wants forgiveness or, or wants mercy, repentance has got to be a part of their deal. But you must be merciful. In other words, you must be ready to extend mercy. And one of the reasons you do so is because of the value of a soul. The, let me say it again. The value of a the value of a soul. The person next to you is far more important than anything that you got going on temporary. Do we understand that? He also lost the reality that God does not desire to destroy, but to save souls. You see, Jonah's mess is God's teachable moment for you and me today. And you say, well, what does this teachable moment tell us? Well, there's a lesson here. The mer- merciful must, be, must remember, in a time of being offended and, a, and being tempted to punish the offender, how much mercy he's already received. Jonah had been in that belly of that fish, and God had shown him mercy. And then the merciful must remember God's priority of the soul and remember that the Lord's desire is not to punish but to save and to bless. And that's what my doctor was talking about this week when she looked at me and she said, I just found out how much God loved me. He's not really looking to come beat me up or strike me down. He wants to do something good for me. With this I close. And all God's people said, Luke 18 tells the story of a man who knew he was a pretty filthy sinner. Verse 13, you know the story. But the tax collector, standing afar off, wouldn't even lift his eyes up into heaven. Instead, he beat his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, he was not the only guy in the room that day. There was another guy in the room who was a religious guy. He went to the Baptist church every Sunday. He put his money in the offering plate. He stood in judgment, you know, he was on the the board of elders and the board of deacons and the board of this committee and that committee. And you say, really? Well, pay attention. And he stood in arrogance and pride. And he said, I don't need forgiveness and I don't need mercy because look at me. Now, here's the evidence event. I'm going to use a word picture for you here. How many of you know what a hug feels like. (laughs) Not many. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, I said this morning in early service, I got in trouble. I said, there's nothing as special as one of your grandbabies come and give you a hug. And I went, and then I caught myself and I said, except for the hug from Mary Jane, of course. (laughs) I want to use that word picture. Just imagine that hug. The story here is a failure to squelch pride and a failure to hug mercy. You see, Jesus said that the sinner who saw mercy as his own remedy, I mean, that poor guy, he was just a a rotten sinner. He knew it. And he said, Jesus, his mercy is my only remedy. And you know what Jesus said about them? That guy went away right with God. He hugged up mercy. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My pride has often made me judge others incorrectly. It has often made me smother out the very characteristics of God that I needed in my life, especially like mercy. And you know what? I was left without the blessings of God as well, without the blessings of God. And I really need those. I really want those, especially if I'm going to carry the case for Jesus out to the world. I really need those blessings, and I really need to be right with God. Now, at some point today, you're going to have to determine whether or not I've made a case for mercy. But with this verse, I want to leave you to ponder your own case for being merciful. Book of Matthew, Jesus is talking, chapter 9, and he's going to quote an ancient prophet, another minor prophet, a guy named Hosea. You remember Hosea, Hosea's wife, he married, uh, Hosea married a woman, and God used his marriage as an object lesson to the people of Israel, and Hosea's wife would leave Hosea, and she would go off and play, uh, she would be a whore and a prostitute, and Hosea would go get her and come back, it went on and on and on for a long time. And, and so, here's what Hosea is in the book of Hosea, Jesus quoted it, because Hosea had mercy, and here's what Jesus quoted Matthew 9 from the book of Hosea. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, here's a final reminder from this verse. Why don't you stand with me while I give you this final reminder. 
You and I can do a lot of religious things. You and I can do a lot of things. We can serve on committees. We can feed the poor. But if we are not merciful, if we don't extend mercy, we have not and will not please God. Now, some of you are thinking about specific situations today. I know I did when I started preparing this message. Like, okay, so what was my mercy supposed to look like? You know, how was, how was I supposed to extend that? You know, what was it supposed to look like? And if you have specific issues that you need to deal with and you need to come and talk to me about it, like, I just need a little help. What does mercy look like in this situation? Then feel free to come and talk to me. But I'm going to tell you something. The point of the matter is, we must be merciful. And it must start in our homes. And I want to tell you something. If we're not merciful, in other words, full of mercy, God says, I'm not pleased with you. And so today I ask you, if God has put a mirror on some event or some situation in your life, remember this, he's asking you to bear his image, and you can't bear his image unless you're full of mercy. Mercy. Or perhaps you're unable to give mercy because you've never requested and received God's mercy for your own life. Maybe you grew up in a church, and maybe you think that that's good enough, and maybe you think that because the culture says certain things are all right in your life, that it's okay. But God's law says it's not okay. And you say, well, I don't care. And so you haven't ever asked God for mercy. Maybe you've never received God's mercy for your own sins. It's my privilege today to tell you that no matter how horrible and no matter how great your sin, God's mercy is greater Let me say it again and get an amen. God's mercy is greater. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I have no business and no right to stand up here today except for God's mercy. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, you have no business sitting in those seats today singing the songs of Zion and worship songs apart from God's mercy. You just don't. And so will you extend your hands of mercy today as you received his. Sing with Steve if you know this song, but let's, let's think about this. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient all knowing he counts not their song. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, is mercy more. What patience would wait as we constantly moan? What father so tender is calling us home? He Welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more.
thank you for the time that we've shared here today and we ask now that you help us to be merciful bless the gift and the giver as we share together in worshiping you with our the first fruits of our incomes and i pray that you would take the money that is received here help us to bless others with it and help us lord to be able to further the kingdom of heaven as we pursue the pallet initiative of taking what we have received and using it for god's glory and then coming back to you to get refilled again, to be used again. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Be